welcome to this uh, webinar uh, organized by the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, WIIW. And uh, my name is Michael Landesmann. I'll moderate uh, this uh, panel discussion. So first of all, we have a wonderful panel with us and I'm very grateful <laughs> that all three of you are with us. Uh, from the invitation, you could see we are covering a rather uh, important topic in uh, current global developments, India's COVID crisis in the global context. The acuteness of uh, this uh, topic should be clear to everybody and covered uh, the headlines in the international media for some time. Uh, recently, I was listening to a discussion uh, with Adam Tooze, the rather well-known historian from Columbia University. And one of the people from the audience, he gave a very impressive coverage of uh, changing geopolitics and geoeconomics in the current world. And one of the audience members was, were asking, why didn't you, why didn't India feature more in your overview? And he was basically saying, well, India is an important country, but definitely doesn't have the weight yet uh, to really influence global economies, uh, global economic developments, even geopolitics, while of course, in comparison, China uh, is undisputable, much, much uh, more important. Now in the current COVID crisis, uh, things uh, seem to be different. Uh, what is happening in India really has uh, enormous uh, implications for what will happen uh, gl globally in terms of the impact uh, on the epidemic, but I think uh, even further than that uh, on uh, other developments, on also global economic developments. So I think it is very timely that we are covering uh, this topic, India, India's COVID crisis in the global context. Um, let me uh, start <laughs> off with introducing the panelists. I will introduce them in the order in which they will uh, enter the discussion. Uh, and thank you again for accepting the invitation. I start with Sujata Rao. Um, Sujata Rao was until uh, a few years ago, uh, Union Secretary in the Ministry of Health and Family of, uh, Welfare of the Government of India, which basically means the top uh, civil servant in this rather crucial ministry. Uh, she is an extremely active person, like everybody on this panel, <laughs> intimidatingly active, all of them. And uh, she uh, launched uh, during her tenure many uh, national campaigns, uh, probably the most prominent uh, of which was uh, a campaign to control the AIDS uh, epidemic. She has covered uh, her experience as, um, uh, as Supremo, basically, in the Administrative Service on Health Issues in a very important uh, authoritative book with a rather telling title, Do We Care? Question uh, mark, India's Health System. It was published by Oxford University Press in 2017. She has represented India on many panels uh, on, in WHO, on, on the UN. She's also on the advisory uh, panel uh, of the Gates Foundation and uh, still very active in the public debate on India's health system. So we're very happy to have you with us. Joy Tigosh, um, until uh, for many, many years, over 30 years, a member of the economics faculty at uh, Nehru University in uh, GNU in uh, Delhi, and uh, has moved very recently uh, to uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, she uh, launched with uh, some colleagues a very, very uh, interesting, important and active uh, association of development economists called IDEAS. She is the executive secretary of that. So please have a look at the website of this uh, rather uh, important uh, association of development uh, studies. Um, uh, she has, apart from her academic credentials, been extremely active also and visible in, uh, in public uh, through pub uh, more, more uh, wide ranging uh, and uh, publications um, in media appearances. Uh, in, you can follow quite a few interesting uh, uh, contributions in the Project Syndicate and also at, for the European audience in uh, Social Europe. Uh, more recently, there was one, uh, one example was a type of manifesto which he published with uh, rather illustrious figures amongst them Michael Spence, Joe Stiglitz, Daniel Roderick. Uh, avoiding a K-shaped global recovery. We speak about K-shaped recoveries in terms of social differentiation within countries, but uh, of course she covered the international dimension that we are very much uh, on uh, in, uh, at the beginning of uh, this rather internationally problematic uh, phase of 
recovery if it comes at all, actually. Uh, she also has a very nice column recently uh, on uh, next steps for people's vaccine and uh, co covering issues, which we will debate over here as well, the uh, current debate on uh, disseminating uh, know-how uh, and uh, how to deal with international property rights. She's also a member of uh, the Commission on uh, for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, a very important topic uh, in today's global uh, policy uh, developments, and also recently uh, in a newly con uh, constituted uh, council by the World Health Organization uh, on the economics of health for all. So last but not least, uh, I'm just, as people come into the debate, we have Shada Islam, who is a well-known expert and commentator on European Union affairs. Uh, she runs her own uh, organization, uh, which is a media and strategy uh, development company, a New Horizons project. She's linked to many other institutions like the European Policy Center in Brussels, the Center for Global Development, the College of Europe at Natalin. Uh, she's a Solvay Fellow at the Vrije University in Brussels. One should mention that really her expertise is particularly in uh, international relations, EU and international context, and particularly on EU Africa, Africa, EU Asia, but of course she covers many other areas, transatlantic relations, and is also an expert on international migration. So let me move on to the structure of the uh, webinar. We will first talk amongst ourselves in a way for the first 50 minutes. Uh, and we will follow more or less the four questions which were also sent out in the, in the invitation, starting off with uh, the uh, India situation directly. How has it come to that? India now accounts for almost 50% of, of uh, global daily infections. And of course, there's a big scare of um, mutants uh, and how that uh, this, uh, uh, disseminates uh, globally, but we want to, to understand more about the internal structure in India, how it is uh, dealt with, how it came about, uh, the rather complex political administrative uh, situation in India, uh, which uh, has to deal uh, and is dealing uh, presumably not uh, terribly efficiently with the situation. From that, uh, uh, I will ask actually Sujata to start us off. She's the most, most in that uh, area. And uh, Joyti will uh, come on to, uh, in on this question as well, but we will move on then beyond India and see what are the implications for the developing world as a whole, developing and emerging economies. Are they, uh, do they experience similar developments which we don't see as prominently? Will they experience similar developments? And in quite a few, there is already uh, evidence for this. And what are the implications overall for global developments, including the uh, repercussions on economic developments. And uh, then we move to the advanced economies, the advanced countries. <clears throat> Is there a failure at the global economic uh, level? What should be the proper response? Uh, this will be addressed by Shada Islam and uh, in the first instance, and then Sujata and Joyti will come in as well. Obviously, we take a critical stance on this, um, uh, uh, but um, uh, we, we want to be constructive. Uh, we want to look forward and analyze what should be done and what are the obstacles to this in a constructive manner. And finally, we zoom in onto the EU. Uh, has the EU been doing enough to fight co uh, the corona crisis globally? It sounds like a rhetorical question because it's obviously not the case here. Yeah? But again, we want to understand what's the obstacles there. And I think there might be a window of opportunity over the coming months, since in most advanced economies, a significant share of the population gets vaccinated. So from this rather introvert, introspective uh, position, which most advanced economies uh, are, uh, have been showing over the last over the entire duration of the crisis so far, probably there's a window of opportunity. And I think this webinar might contribute to, in a constructive way, to uh, say uh, in which direction should it go. I should mention to you, uh, uh, please um, put your uh, comments and questions. You can uh, be critical as much as <laughs> you would like uh, in the chat uh, function of this, uh, uh, which, you will, uh, which I think you are probably all used to. You will see that you can click on whether you want only panelists to see your comments, but there's no reason for that, uh, or all attendees, there's a sort of uh, option which you can click on on the side. So we look forward to an interesting debate uh, with all of you, and we start with the panelists. Susu Jatta, tell us about developments in India and also in a forward-looking manner. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for having invited me to give you an overview of what's happening on 
COVID-19 in India. Uh, I have a very painful story. It's been extremely hard times that we're going through now. Uh, almost uh, many of us have seen friends uh, that we have lost, people who are battling, people we know battling in the hospital for their life. And it has been a very painful period. So it's not very good news that I have because right now, as I speak, we are clocking in at least about a 400,000 cases per day with almost an average of 4,000 people dying every single day. So, you know, the, the whole uh, situation is rather grim and very serious as the epidemic is, uh, pandemic is literally, the virus is kind of rampaging through the country, north to south. Now, how did we get here? It was on 30th of January that we, we diagnosed the first case in, uh, in India, in Kerala. And uh, from there, uh, you know, then it was, uh, we found another two more cases the day, the day after that. It was well managed, contained, nobody died. And there, though there were these routine advisories going from the Ministry of Health to the state governments, but nothing, it was not taken very seriously. And that's a very major mistake we made in not taking COVID very seriously. In February, we lost a whole month. We lost a whole month and a half. It was only after March 11th when WHO declared it as a pandemic of concern that I think the government of India really political at the political level sat up and took note. And, uh, but then within 10 days, that is say on 22nd or 21st March, we had just about 258 cases and uh, four deaths. But even so the next day, I mean, the modelers came in with that skimpy data, they started projecting something like, oh, 800 million people will be infected and so many will, will die and so on and so forth, which really put us into a panic mode and a lockdown was a nationwide lockdown was announced within four hours notice. Now that lockdown, I mean, a lockdown has, uh, is the first time I've seen, I've been in the public health space for two decades, but I've never come across a question of a lockdown as a public health tool to contain disease. This was an innovation that China really brought in in Wuhan. They found it effective. Uh, and that was uh, adopted slowly in all the countries and in India, we did it nationwide. We have a, we are a country with 1.3 billion people and uh, the whole country was locked down. Uh, and that really did uh, trigger another problem, a huge, one of the largest humanitarian crisis, uh, which was unthinkable. We, no one expected it. And it was these millions of migrants. We have a huge population of circular as we call it circular migra migration, because they come from rural areas to the developed zone, parts of the country in the cities work, and then it's largely seasonal, and then they keep going back to their home and coming back again. So we call them circular migrants. And there are about 400 million of them. So from these cities with the lockdown, which kept on getting extended in piecemeal fashion in an ad hoc manner, we, we found these uh, horrific situations where the migrants started uh, going back since public transport was also locked down. There were no trains running. The, the, we had migrants walking some 600 to 1,000 kilometers to reach their homes. So it was a huge and a horrific human tragedy that was unfolding. But anyway, uh, by about May 17th, the lockdown was lifted. And by then we also got into a situation where we found a total economic collapse. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, uh, we, we thought we had, we, the lockdown had been useful in the sense that we didn't even have one protective, as we call the PPEs, protective gear, you know, that doctors and nurses and caregivers have to wear. We didn't have any, and by the end of this lockdown, we literally became an exporting nation. We started exporting them with millions. Uh, we, we stimulated the industry for that. And more importantly, we, we got mass uh, uh, manufactured gloves and all these kind of protective uh, uh, consumables, but more importantly, the testing. And so from say something like 14 laboratories, by August, we had about 2000 of them functioning doing PCR tests. And uh, slowly, of course, that has become a lot, much larger. Today, we do 2 million tests a day. We have that capacity, which we didn't have way back. So in a year's time, I mean, we really developed our infrastructure capacity to cope with this disease. And we, we hospital beds, something like 200,000 beds. Today we have almost 
been able to ramp it up to close to 2 million beds that, uh, you know, of course, not all of them are oxygen supported or ventilator supported, but at least there are some hospital beds that the people can come and rest in. So this was a kind of ramping up of the infrastructure that they did do and prepared themselves for what could have been a bit of an onslaught of a situation. Uh, and to that extent, the, uh, uh, pan uh, the lockdown did help. But we never really, though we knew it was only a pause to the infection, we didn't realize that it was still lurking very quietly. And that was the strategy that time that was being followed was a con uh, declaring containment zones, uh, identifying hotspots, wherever there was a positive case, we would uh, take them, we, you know, sort of test, to trace, isolate, treat. This was a classic mantra that we followed. And that was being done very, very assiduously uh, by particularly some of the states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu did a, and Rajasthan and these some of the states did a fantastic job of identifying, plucking them from the community, isolating them and uh, testing the family members and trying to contain the infection within that zone and within that area from spreading. No, I think all these measures did have their own uh, impact or whether it was a strain, but in, nevertheless, by August, middle of August, we had about 1,500, uh, I mean, we, we have, the caseloads slowly started creeping up. And, uh, you know, by about uh, September, middle of September, we reached a peak. And the highest that we touched was on September 14th, if I remember correctly, was about 98,000 cases. And uh, so, you know, and we kept thinking that, you know, this is really increasing, but maybe it's, it will just start declining and it did and uh, slowly but surely the the caseload began declining the deaths began declining we reached a point where we barely had 16 deaths and a couple of hundred cases and by october november december we we really fell into a complacency saying that we have won over the battle we are now free of uh, uh, covid and that was a huge strategic mistake now, public health experts and epidemiologists from December started saying, no, we should expect a, a second wave. But honestly, that didn't sink in either to the political leadership nor to the people. And uh, we, we found that uh, by um, February, March, the cases, caseload began really sharply increasing. And this wave two, which is a double mutant or it is a British strain, B117, we have B1617 and whatever the mutant combinations were, but by Job, they have been extremely virulent. And uh, we found within a space, I mean, April has been, uh, has been traumatic uh, with the kind of uh, leap that we had in the number of caseloads and the number of deaths. Unlike in wave one here, we find within a shorter period, uh, people dying. But we also found the good news that those who could get vaccinated the severity of the disease had been reduced and the deaths were very minimal among them. So that was, uh, that was a story about, we found 85, our data shows about 86%, 87% either asymptomatic or they are very, very mild, uh, but it is the 16, 17% of the people who are going to the moderate or severe cases and about three to 4% are dying on account of uh, COVID. Now in India, we have a, a situation where, uh, you know, we are not a federal country as per the constitution. We are a unitary country uh, in the sense that the, the, the central government, the union government is a central force and we have states. So it's called the union of uh, uh, union government, a union of states, but the states have a lot of space and autonomy. They have their own chief minister. They have their own political system. They have their own legislature. And so though they're not a federation in the classical uh, definition of what federation means, but nevertheless, they, there is a relationship between the central and state, which is guided by the constitution, which clearly spells out what the union powers are, what the uh, state powers are, and which are those areas where the union and the states, both uh, they're called concurrent powers, can concurrently adjudicate and concurrently implement. So infectious, while health is a state subject, it is a domain of the state to look after health subjects. It is in the concurrent list that infectious diseases uh, 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 is a shared responsibility between the union government and the state government under which 
the union government provides vaccines and financial support and so on. So it is under that power that they literally uh, invoked the National Disaster Management Act and centralized this entire uh, management of the COVID epidemic pandemic into the central hands, giving instructions to the states to what to do and what not to do. So now where are we? We are in a situation where the virus is really rampaging through the country. Uh, even as I speak about 15 states, we have, we have states, 30 states and 15 of them, half the country has a positivity rate of more than 21%. And uh, in five states, the positivity rate is somewhere between uh, 50 to 32%. That means in Goa, you, know, you might have heard of Goa because it's a popular tourist destination. Every second person is, uh, is positive. It's that high. And it was completely zero positivity in wave one. And from there, it has suddenly picked up in April, uh, you know, and uh, it, is, uh, it is extremely uh, virulent in that area. And 28 people died the day before yesterday and go off for lack of oxygen. Now this huge caseload has overwhelmed our health system, but I would like to say in defense of the health system, not that India had a great health system. We've always started our chapters saying in, uh, India's health system is in the ICU. We know that we, uh, we were not spending enough. Health was never politically an important area of concern all these 70 years, irrespective of the political persuasion. And so health has been uh, a neglected area. But even if in the best scenario, even if we had a relatively good and a well-functioning health system, we would have been overwhelmed with the kind of caseloads that we are, we are getting. They, hospitals are full, public and private. We have a huge private sector, uh, largely corporate and then small nursing homes and so on, which, which do in normal times get a large uh, share of the outpatients and 50% of the inpatient uh, caseloads. But in the case of uh, COVID, it was a public hospital that really took the lead because uh, the private hospitals were not very keenly looking forward. To, but today, they even they are overwhelmed with the number of cases of people coming there. And what has really struck us is that oxygen, because we were in this complacent mood, we, we had, uh, you know, invited this whole COVID onto ourselves. We had no social distancing. We had our survey, zero surveillance showed that though we were not, uh, we didn't have many infected people, and we had a lot of people who were uninfected, yet we allowed large social gatherings. We have a religious ritual once in 12 years where a million people go to a river to bathe. We allowed that. We allowed uh, state level elections. And in, in elections in India are raucous uh, uh, um, events where thousands uh, just congregate and, and mill together all the time. So all these things which we, you know, so life was more than normal. And this is what contributed to the, to the uh, virus really gaining strength and going from strength to strength. So now in trying to control it, it has become a problem. So now uh, we have only today, it's gone into the community. There's no point doing tracing and tracking and so on. Uh, we have a capacity to test 2 million people, which we are doing. Uh, um, but, uh, but the point really is that hospitals are overwhelmed for want of oxygen. They overwhelmed for want of uh, uh, doctors. Doctors and caregivers are exhausted. So we are now even trying to, the government of India said they will put in and permit the senior students of the medical colleges and postgraduate education to go and work in the hospitals uh, for, uh, for an incentive. So these are the kind of human resource strategies and parks, uh, stadia are all being converted into hospitals with ventilator and oxygen support. Now, what is next for us? What we have, we have to get out of this. The epidemiologists are saying that we may carry on like this till about end of this month, but the, the, the go down, uh, going down, the, it's not going to be very helpful to us. The virus will take its own time. So we can't expect a sharp fall. We are, so it's going to be very gradient. It's going to be very, very uh, uh, gradual. So therefore, I think till about June, July, some people are expecting us to have adequately uh, disturbing caseloads and deaths occurring, but then it will peter out. But, not, but most are saying that we should expect a third wave. And that is probably and largely because our vaccination didn't take off. 
Our vaccination policy was a little bit uh, of a mess, if I may put that. It's a strong word to say, but yes, it is a bit of an unfortunate situation where we have not really prepared ourselves very well uh, for uh, stockpiling and having a vaccination strategy in place. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, we have only two options. That is COVID appropriate behavior, which has the three components of using a mask, of distancing and washing hands. The washing hands and distancing is, is a luxury for millions of our people. So masks becomes the most important uh, um, intervention that we can think of. Uh, and that is what is being emphasized upon. And vaccination is as next a preventive tool that we have and that we are still working on. Uh, right now, uh, we, are, we are manufacturing about 62 million uh, uh, doses of vaccines, which are being used and deployed. About 17% of our people have uh, got one dose and about uh, eight to 10% of people have two doses, but that's the way to go in the future. So it's, it's very disturbing and uh, we have different political parties, but I must say, uh, political, politically, the differences have been able to contain a little bit, but everyone is equally worried. And uh, uh, the acrimony that we see normally isn't so bad, but then uh, it's a delicate relationship that we have. Uh, uh, and, you know, it has to be managed very well because the central government has, is really uh, did, uh, did fault very severely in having overlooked and for the oversight not having taken this seriously beforehand and prepared the country. And lastly, I would say that uh, we have a very strong pharma industry. So there is this movement coming in, uh, you know, where, where two chief ministers have already written to the prime minister asking for compulsory licensing to be invoked uh, on a company that is indigenous, where the vaccine is indigenously being manufactured. There's a so motor petition in the Supreme Court, uh, which is looking at all these issues. So there is some movement at that end. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the pharma industry being strong, we hope that we can, in the next three, four months, get some, some sort of a vaccine security, which will help us to tide over this uh, uh, pandemic. And, uh, and the private sector has, of course, been very solidly uh, with us in terms of, uh, there are several rumors, no doubt, that they charge a lot of their price gouging and their uh, exorbitant rates are being, but then, you know, that goes on in a, in a situation where the supply is lesser than the demand. But I would like to end then and be happy to take any questions that you might have later on, but it is a very huge challenge that we are facing in India and it's, uh, it's very problematic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sujata, for this overview. Uh, Joy, to you <laughs> add your views on what is happening in India and then widen it to what's going on uh, in other parts of the developing world. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And I think Sujata has provided an excellent interview mm -hmm. uh, overview. I'm going to actually make it a little stronger. I, I believe this is a creative catastrophe. I believe it is policy induced. The second wave, for sure. These are not inevitable waves. These are waves that result not just from complacency, but by sponsored super spreader events. I think Sujata mentioned the elections, the bringing forward of a major festival, which happens every 12 years. This was brought forward. It's happening in the 11th year um, because of some astrologers. And 4 million people gathered at a relatively small part of the banks of the Ganges. And all of these are directly involved in, in the huge super spreading that we have seen. What we have to remember also is that this is coming the second wave is coming to a very debilitated population. India was one of the few countries that provided hardly any social protection. I mean, all the global indicators suggest that we were one of the worst in terms of the minimum protection provided to people who were denied their livelihoods during this lockdown, this centrally induced lockdown that Sujata talked about. And this has huge implications because 95% of our workers are informal. They don't get any automatic protection from employers. So without that legal and social protection, we had a collapse of livelihoods, not just among wage workers, but including the self-employed. It was only in the rural areas and agriculture that there was some, go, you know, that we kept going because we had a good monsoon, a good harvest, but otherwise the economy as a whole was severely battered, of course, but people were hugely battered. 
Nutrition levels have suffered. All the surveys that we have seen on the ground suggest dramatic declines in nutrition of adults and children and of pregnant and lactating mothers. We've seen decline in various other health services, whether it's immunization or delivery of childbirth, etc. We've seen dramatic deterioration of health conditions and of livelihood, which means that it's already an enervated population on which you're getting the second wave. This time, they're not even talking about relief. At least last time, there were some proposals. It's true that finally the spending, the public spending did not match the grandiose statement, but nonetheless, there were some efforts at centralized relief. This time, there is absolutely none. The state governments are being left alone to do the lockdowns or whatever they have to do on their own. I want to also emphasize, Sujata mentioned the center-state relations. It's a very fiscally fraught situation because the central government holds all the cards in terms of resources. Like all central governments everywhere in the world, they are the ones who can borrow from the central bank. They are the ones who can basically print money. State governments cannot. They have hard budget constraints. The central government still owes state governments money because of a previous agreement that they have reneged on. So, you know, they are really short of money. Their tax revenues, such as they were, or their share of tax revenues collapsed last year. Yet they were forced to bear the burden of this huge impact of the disease, whether it is the lockdowns and the economic implications or the additional health spending. The central government provided 0.15% of GDP additionally. 0.15% in terms of the health spending available. And that too spread over two years. So it was ridiculous, the kinds of money that they had. It really meant that they had to stop spending on other things, front load all their spending. They are now all facing massive debt burdens and they're faced with the second wave without any evidence of more money being provided. So central government has basically announced a lockdown through a centralized scheme, the National Disaster Management Act and then left the state governments to deal with it. I don't, I mean, this is not political per se. There are politics involved. I don't agree with Sujata that it's not political because we know some state governments led uh, by a particular party, the ruling party at the center, get more vaccines, get more money for ventilators, get more oxygen than other states led by opposition parties. So That's all of that is also happening. Yes. But nonetheless, it's the overall collapse of a system in which you are leaving the state governments to deal with the thing that is largely, I would say, central government created. I also do not agree that the back, I mean, it's not just a mess. I think it's a crime what has happened with vaccines. Because India, uh, yes, uh, we have the largest vaccine producer in the world, but it is under contract with AstraZeneca. And that's another issue about the fact that it's a patented drug developed by Oxford University, which should have been in the public domain, but essentially was privatized. But we do have a domestically produced, approved vaccine, and we have two others in the pipeline. The, the compulsory licenses for these should have been issued in November when they were approved by the government. The co-vaccine, which is a domestically produced thing with the help of ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research, should have been produced by at least eight producers who are willing to do that in India, who are available and willing. We could have actually done that. Not only did they not do that, the central government didn't even place orders for enough vaccines. This, they placed, uh, I think, what, 120 million in, in January, and now another, I think they just placed another order in April. It's going to take months for those to be produced. They haven't expanded the production facilities, which is obscene. But I would also like to point out, India is the only country in the world that is making people pay for COVID-19 vaccines. It's unthinkable in a pandemic to privatize vaccine distribution and make people pay. So there are two crazy things one going on. One is that the central government has bought some vaccines and then suddenly in March told the state government, now you go and buy on your own. You go and negotiate with the companies. You are on your own to negotiate with the companies. The companies are charging four times the price that they are charging the central government. And then the private, then they're saying with, for the ages 15 to, uh, sorry, 18 to 45, you can go to a private clinic and, or hospital and get a vaccine where you will pay 10 times, 20 times what the central government paid. And so individuals are being made to pay for a vaccine. It's not a question of just, you know, this happens in periods of scarcity. No, it is happening in no country in the world. 
This is the only country where after 70 years of a successful universal free immunization program, we have destroyed it completely. This government, I will, let me, re, let me change it. This government- This is a change of policy, no? I mean, it wasn't the case before because India was quite well known for free vaccination, yeah. This is a policy of the central government, I repeat, the central government. State mm -hmm. governments have gone to court on this matter. Mm -hmm. So this is a central government policy. Let's not kid ourselves that, you know, we, we. I, Sujata, it's not we. It is a central government that has done this. And it is against the wishes of state governments, against the wishes of people, and it is ridiculous. It makes absolutely no sense. Correct. What all this means is that after a period when we've had a terrible economic downswing, where people's livelihoods have been destroyed, we are now going in for an even worse situation. So it's a medium term slump. There's no question about it. Also because the fiscal response has been atrocious. We have one of the poorest fiscal responses in the world in terms of additional spending. Uh, not even 2% of GDP additional. In fact, I think it's 1.2%. And now I, I suspect that it will go come down. Public spending is actually lower. What this means in terms of, if you like, the negative multiplier effects, you can imagine that this is heading for a major medium term slump. So it's a very grim outlook. Uh, I, to get to the regional, I, it's not just a case that it's terrible because we have 1.3 billion people and you know so on, but it's because India's plight has direct implications for the rest of the world. We, it's, it's not just that we're all in this together, it is that India, because of its weight in both the region and in global population, what happens in India cannot stay in India. It is going to spread. We know already the disease is spreading in South Asia. It's gone to Southeast Asia. They are getting a revival with the new strain, with the new particularly infectious strain that was uh, discovered first in India, which is a combination of the UK and some of the local and so on. We also know that this medium term thinking of the economy puts significant downward pressure on the region and the region's possibilities for expansion and also for the world economy. It's true, India has a relatively small share of the global economy. But on the other hand, because India was seen uh, by virtue of its previous dynamism over the last two decades and the large population, it was seen as one of the growing markets. In a period of market saturation in the rest of the world, it was seen as a potential area of growth. That is near, definitely not the case. It will be a drag rather than an, a stimulus for the region. There are, of course, the geopolitical implications of a weakened India, particularly, you know, the, the Western countries that are hoping the Quad and so on for a kind of, you know, combined front against the rise of China. There are significant implications, which I'm sure would not have been lost on anyone. So essentially, I think it's in the self-interest of the developed world to step up a global response that would also positively affect India. And I don't just mean in terms of, you know, the kind hearted gestures of sending oxygen and sending ventilators and so on. I mean, in terms of addressing an international architecture that has inhibited India and a whole lot of other developing countries from actually being able to cope with this pandemic and uh, being able to provide the kinds of public responses that people in Europe and the United States are now taking for granted. So there are many aspects to this. There is, of course, the issue of vaccine production and distribution. If ever there was a global public good, it's vaccines during a pandemic. I think that should be a no brainer, but apparently it isn't. It's, in, it's good to note that a new report that was independently commissioned by the WHO with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and um, the New Zealand former prime minister have come up with a proposal that we should actually set up a global facility for promoting the development, production, and distribution of vaccines and no longer treat it as something that can be, you know, the plaything of markets and nation states, because that clearly is counterproductive. But we do have to think of ways in which we can avoid vaccine nationalism, which is so deeply counterproductive. And when these are developed with public resources, sometimes directly because of prior public research and sometimes because of massive subsidies, in this case, the large subsidies given, that these should be in public hands. This knowledge should be in public hands and for public dissemination. But there are other things that can be done. There will be a new SDR allocation by the IMF. Hopefully by July, it will be done. 
many countries, surplus countries, those with already large reserves and uh, you know, uh, global currencies are not going to use these reserves. Those should be made available, for example, to the COVAX facility, for example, to other measures that would actually create you know, the WHO accelerator that would actually provide resources directly to developing countries to deal with this public health emergency. Capital markets today are suppressing the fiscal responses of developing countries. Countries like Mexico, India, one of the reasons they haven't spent more is because they're worried about capital flight and downgrading by credit rating agencies. So we need to think of allowing, enabling, encouraging capital management policies that don't leave countries at the whim of this very mobile capital and a public credit rating agency. Because the other thing that is happening is that the private credit rating agencies downgrade governments the minute they try and spend more. Of course, debt restructuring is another larger issue, which has to be dealt with, I think, at the global level. But there are many things that could be done by the rich countries and certainly by the European Union, which need to be done urgently and have to be there on the table and addressed as soon as possible. Let me stop here. <laughs> Thank Jyoti. Uh, thanks also for starting a bit of a debate <laughs> how to see things in India. Uh, Shada, we, we started uh, already on the discussion on the global situation and the stance which uh, Jyoti mentioned the international organization like the IMF uh, might take and something about the governance structure which seems to be problematic at the global level. So how do you judge uh, the developments at the global level? And uh, now uh, the sort of uh, burden of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, supply, uh, not supply, uh, the, uh, the owners basically, which has to shift towards those countries now who have increasingly moved to a better situation, which are the advanced economies. Uh, we see now uh, basically uh, some sort of control, we don't know whether it will last of the health situation, but we also see some economic recovery. So what uh, are the, let's say, the courageous steps which uh, should move, we should move towards uh, over the coming months? Shada. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you, Sujata and JT, for some very sobering thoughts and reflections. And I wish more people were listening to this because I think you brought really uh, the hammer on the nail and uh, we need to in Europe wake up to not solidarity questions uh, but also our responsibility as a part of the global community and I think frankly Michael what um, this new panel well not a new panel but Helen Clark and uh, Johnson Sirleaf have come up with this independent panel on global health threats and council you know this uh, came out today I think that sort of really is a very defining moment uh, as uh, you know, Western countries and uh, countries across the world look at how the mistakes we've made, the errors that we've made and to move forward. Because I think we can, we can look back um, and cry over all the mistakes and all the challenges we did not meet and we allowed the situation to develop. But what really need to, needs to happen now is global leadership and Helen Clark and Sylvia Johnson really point their finger at everyone and I think this is crucial. Now, uh, I just take a few points that uh, Jayati and, and Sujata have talked about. I mean, India, uh, from the geopolitical point of view, as you know, Michael, I look at geopolitics very closely and it's clear that what is happening in India, the tragedy unfolding in India has drawn attention uh, worldwide. And the European Union finally has got the wake up call uh, to, to the need of the urgency, as JT has mentioned, the emergency that we're living in, and that we shall no longer continue to look at us and them, uh, look inwards and think that we uh, have a kind of fortress and we are um, not as vulnerable as other communities. And I think that's been implicit in many of the ways that the European Union and its member states have, have thought about it. I'm European, very proud to be part of Europe and, and European, but we also have to be critical in all the mistakes we've made. So India is helping to draw attention. And JT has pointed to South Asia, Southeast Asia. And my concern is that we're not really prepared for what's happening in South Asia. I'm in contact with countries across South Asia. Um, the situation is pretty dire. Uh, Eid, uh, the uh, holy day of Eid is coming up in many parts of uh, South Asia. Uh, lockdowns have been announced uh, in many of these countries. People are not going to be able to meet. I mean, you know, as Jyoti has pointed out, these are very poor people. 
uh, and are desperate for contact at this point. They live in very small accommodations and they, they won't be able to do that. So that's a real, um, let's say, personal loss for many people, apart from the fact that many, of course, have died or are suffering. So no one's looking at the wider issue of South Asia. And I would wish now that we would use this wake up call of India to look at Africa and prepare for, uh, God forbid, what could be happening uh, in the next few weeks in Africa. But I do not see, I do not see that sense of responsibility emerging just yet from the European Union. So India is going through a rebranding exercise as uh, JT has pointed out as a counterbalance, if you like, to the, uh, to the power of China. Uh, there has been a lot of geopolitics that has come into the EU's response. Um, you know, uh, being very, very sort of, let's say, uh, disdainful of the Chinese vaccine, of the Russian vaccine, um, fighting of battles of mass diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy within ourselves. We've had um, a lot of protectionism within countries as well. So Europe hasn't been very good uh, internally or externally. And uh, of course, we can argue uh, a long time about why this has happened, but some of what uh, Sujata was saying about centralized EU uh, not being really competent on health, um, this being a member state uh, competency and member states then being rivals and approaching pharmaceutical companies and doing their deals uh, with pharmaceutical companies. And then the European Commission, which as you all know, is not really competent yet in these areas, uh, being perhaps lured into deals that were not as strict legally as they expected it to be. So as you know, there are quite a few legal cases now that have been launched against AstraZeneca by the European Commission because of you know, uh, faulty supplies and shortages of supplies. The mood is changing. Uh, of course, the mood is changing here uh, because vaccine rollouts are going ahead now. And you know, there is a prediction that 70% of the adult population will be vaccinated by the end of July. And then hello, hooray, hooray, we'll all be able to travel. We'll get these green certificates. Um, we'll be able to get on our trains and our planes and visit other countries, sit on beaches and have a good time. Uh, so very inward looking and very much looking at our own uh, future, sitting in the sunshine after 14 months of quite difficult lockdowns. But let's say there is a fear of the third wave and of course mutants uh, and, and variants that you've talked about. So I'm hoping that policymakers will show a sense of responsibility that they always talk about. Two things have happened. So there has been this EU India summit that was held uh, virtually with the Narendra Modi virtually, but the EU leaders, most of them were in Porto. And there, of course, there have been these um, um, declarations of generosity as JIP has called it, uh, where the EU will be sending more vaccines, they'll be sending oxygen, we'll be sending um, components, et cetera, to the country, uh, to India. And so there's been this also this promise of working together for the reform of the global health system, reform of the WHO, et cetera. But very, very little has been said um, on, uh, on actually the big demand that India and South Africa have made about um, uh, waiver for patents, intellectual property rights should be shared and there should be a waiver in the WTO so that legal proceedings are not taken by countries who do um, want to ramp up production and need uh, technology and uh, patents enabled to do that. So there is, um, there is a wake up call, as I said to you, but I'm not convinced. What's happened with that is that we are very divided again, very, very divided. So you show support uh, to uh, Prime Minister Modi, solidarity, support, uh, generosity. But then when you go back from that summit, of course, we've had uh, uh, Chancellor, German Chancellor Angela Merkel saying, you know, patents are needed for innovation. We cannot, you know, give them away because then we're actually destroying innovation and creativity is the source of you know, um, a lot of innovation, we need creativity, and we will not do that if we accept a waiver. Joe Biden's coming on board with the waiver has actually <laughs> created enormous um, uh, embarrassment for the EU, because first of all, we were not consulted. So, you know, there goes the transatlantic relationship, in a sense, if we're not consulted on such a big move, we've been shown to be a backward, um, slow, uh, and not actually jumping onto the bandwagon, because as I said, there's a lot of resistance coming from big pharma, of course, from the pharmaceutical companies, but also coming from geopolitical rivalries and jealousies. So looking forward, I think there's certain things that we are and will be doing, because as I said, we've been wrong-footed, 
the European Union has uh, lost the mantle of global leadership in this area because uh, that's what they aspire to. That's what the EU's aspiration has always been. You know, we are the good guys in the world. Um, we believe in, you know, development, cooperation and all the rest of it. Um, our partnership with Africa is still shown to be, you know, a big uh, sort of uh, coming together of, you know, uh, countries working together. Uh, for development and all of this relies on a certain degree now is the testing time now is where you have been challenged and tested um, so now the focus is uh, I think I have five or six things COVAX um, you know the EU is now calling itself a, sort of the biggest uh, supplier of funding to COVAX um, technology transfer is something that they are talking about also uh, so we're helping to ramp up production through technology um, sending more vaccines we've talked about that drawing up a global pl plan there are questions of you know actually following up on what many people are saying should be now not just a piecemeal uh, uh, look at what's happening in India and then Africa and then South Asia, Latin America, Brazil is a problem, of course, also. And then, of course, the question of the waiver. And then HIT is one thing that is, I think, um, perhaps a bit reassuring, um, is that non-governmental organizations and members of the European Parliament and prime ministers like Pedro Sanchez of Spain have come forward and are putting the pressure on the EU to, to actually take this on board and to get onto the bandwagon that Joe Biden has started. And the argument that yes, of course, the immediate needs will not be met. This is a so process, but at least you make a start. And I think that pressure uh, is going to continue and gain momentum. And uh, I'm hoping that there will be uh, recognition that this is something that we have to do together on the global field and that we stop looking inward and to the sunshine and the beaches. And we also think about what's happening in our world uh, where people are, are not going to be uh, able to enjoy life or are facing really uh, death and tragedy in their daily lives. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Shada. Uh, well, uh, let me pick up some uh, a few questions already. Some uh, you you were already diligent answering some <laughs> already. Some are more narrowly uh, health issues. Uh, well, uh, or but of course uh, socially important. Uh, one question probably to Sujata was on the vitamin D deficiency. How how come that is such a pervasive issue uh, in uh, in in India? Um, there was a question on whether vaccines are really uh, do cost something, but I think uh, JIT already uh, clarified whether uh, they are free or to which extent they are costly. Uh, uh, I think it was important for JIT to point out this uh, price differentiation which is taking place and which is a natural reaction by pharmaceutical companies when you open up differentiated markets. Uh, and I think uh, Sujata has written quite uh, strong, uh, uh, strongly in the Indian media, uh, again, uh, for a much stronger responsibility by the state government. Uh, so uh, we will see whether the Indian government is changing its position, because this is uh, uh, really not working in terms of apparently the vaccine rates are declining at the moment yeah rather than increasing yeah. in India which is <laughs> an enormous uh, problem there was uh, so I think uh, uh, Sujata you might want to answer these uh, issues and probably uh, elaborate a bit more on India and Joyce there was this long <laughs> uh, long uh, let's say dispute with you on uh, on the prospects of economic recovery in India uh, uh, Anupa doesn't think that, uh, uh, doesn't agree with the medium term slump theory that uh, apparently there is quite an indication as soon as the lockdowns are, uh, um, uh, are reduced basically that there is a quite strong pickup of activity and exporting apparently has increased. You might want to speak more about the economic implications of that. Um, uh, Shada, I want to add uh, a question to you as well, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, well, I think Africa is not very much on the map at the moment in terms of uh, the discussion about the potential uh, crisis which might unfold. And I think uh, so one is always running to where the uh, limelight is shining <laughs> at the moment and it's shining on India. But obviously uh, the situation in Africa is interesting because it's also highly differentiated. I mean, the capabilities, also the health sector are quite differentiated. And I think I would like to pick up a bit more the issue of um, how uh, will uh, EU governments uh, uh, use their leverage over 
the rather important sector of the <laughs> your industry, which is the pharmaceutical sector, which is its big pride, actually, uh, use it for an international mission uh, in, in, in the direction. I think we discussed it amongst ourselves that it really means a strong intervention into market structures here yeah, uh, to um, uh, really lead to a much greater widening of the potential which is there in terms of vaccine production, vaccine development, widening uh, the scope. And uh, probably a final comment on that. Uh, well, the Biden uh, waiver um, commitment, in a sense, uh, is, is an important one. But I listened recently to a uh, commentary by a very well-informed Indian uh, health uh, uh, expert. And he said it's still too limited, basically, <laughs> because it is a waiver on the vaccine itself, but not on all the ingredients and the wider ramifications, so let's say the equipment you need to produce, etc. So you need a much wider a waiver on uh, the TRIPS uh, agreement to really make it effective. Um, uh, and I wanted to, to draw you out on that. This is really not widely discussed, I think, but it should also be brought in when one speaks about the potential uh, adjustment to the TRIPS uh, situation. So Sujata, <laughs> you first. Yeah, uh, Michael, <laughs> you know, the, the situation is that uh, we are really, it's like a house on fire. So right mm -hmm. now the whole attention of almost everyone and rightly also has been on trying to save lives and mm -hmm. save lives meaning the epidemic, the pandemic is kind of not only uh, ravaged the whole uh, urban city landscape, but it is rapidly moving into the rural areas. And while in the Southern states of Kerala or Tamil Nadu, even if it gets into the rural areas, I'm not terribly worried in that sense because there, there is a certain infrastructure that can take care of of uh, uh, and cope with that uh, uh, the 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 wave, but it is the northern states where the health systems are very fragile, and it is hitting the rural areas. That is going to be a very major challenge, because it would really require for the central government to sit down and take a much more comprehensive, holistic view of the effort, which literally means allowing civil society participation allowing for local bodies to participate, allowing for all the stakeholders and actors to come in, which is not really the case till up until now. It has been purely a governmental bureaucratic response that has to go on what, like what we saw in the polio uh, eradication movement, it has to be a, a much more uh, a solid effort. And why I'm saying this is that this pandemic has intensified hunger levels much more. I mean, it's just not only a question of unemployment, loss of incomes and so on, but even lack of access to adequate food has become a very, now recently government of India has sanctioned five kgs of uh, cereals to every uh, person or something like that, you know, but that's just only a, a, a band-aid. Uh, basically hunger is increased. There is all, there are also studies to show that middle class, the low middle class people have, have joined the below poverty line uh, uh, ranks of the population. So poverty has also increased much more than what is being actually acknowledged and recognized. And therefore, when you say vitamin D, vitamin D is only a small issue. We have 40% before the pandemic, 37% of children were stunted, means chronic hunger causes stunting. So now this must have even gone up much more. It must be now 40% of our children must be um, uh, you know, worse off in terms of malnutrition. So after this COVID uh, pandemic, the immediate concerns of medicines, drugs and oxygen and beds and ventilators, all that is over and quietened down. We'll have to, we'll have to go through a huge phase of reconstruction, literally uh, make, you know, really rebuild lives which have been uh, shattered. It is very severe in the rural areas because I do interact and work with NGOs and the reports that are coming, particularly in northern states, is quite dismal. On the second uh, question of the vaccine, you see the problem here is the, we had all these years one simple policy. Central government would buy, uh, centrally it would procure the vaccines by issuing a tender and everybody could uh, tender for it. The lowest bid is taken procures it and then supplies it to the state governments. 
supplies, I mean, it is the central government that has built the whole cold chain. It has trained all the vaccinators, whether it was for polio, we about 14 vaccines are provided free of cost to the people of India if they come to any public facility. But you also have a dual system where if you, Michael, want to go and have your baby to get a polio shots in a private hospital, yes, you can go there, but you can come to a public facility and get it free. You have to pay something in the private facility. But that's a very minus, minuscule uh, percentage of the population that goes to these uh, hospitals and gets a vaccination. 90% come to our public facilities. Now that policy was set aside, and this is a strange policy that has come up. And I cannot understand the motivation behind it, where there are three different differential prices, where the pharmaceutical companies were permitted to set the price. It's not that we determined, a, it's not an administered price based on certain kind of costing. It's not a price that has come through a tender. There's no competition or anything. Just we told, the government told the private sector, you tell us what you want and that's it. So the central government is procuring 50% of whatever is produced at $3, two and a half dollars uh, of dose. And the state governments are paying double, more than one and a half times uh, they have to procure it. And this, as Jyoti said, the, the private sector pays even higher. Now that is not very good because even though to the consumer uh, between the center and the state, because most states have said we we'll provide it free, it may come as a free vaccine, but there's an opportunity cause. The state governments uh, have now to shell out three times more money than the central government to buy the same uh, vaccine, same product, which could have gone in ramping up the health infrastructure if the central government uh, provided it free. So these are the issues that now have become big issues of agitation between the, uh, uh, the state government's political system and the central government. And the Supreme Court is hearing this case tomorrow on pricing and on, uh, on uh, levying compulsory license. Because I do agree that there's no point, I think Joyti and Shad would, uh, will cover the patent issues, but I think pending what is going to happen because RNA technology in India is very tough to adopt. We have another two vaccines, which are easier to replicate in India by, as Joyti said, our vaccine companies. And we did the compulsory licensing within two, three months. Today, we are now going to, in July onwards, till from July, 120 million doses have been promised by these two companies. But to cover up, to, to get 70% of, vac of vaccination done, we need to have a minimum of 300 to 400 million doses, and we ought to be doing at least 10 million vaccinations a day. Unless we aim at that level, and we, unless we have that ambition, I'm afraid we are not going to be able to vaccinate even 70% to provide the herd immunity, and the third wave can be even worse because it's the naive population which is uninfected are our young people and children, and that they may get affected is my fear, but also I've heard some other experts voice the same fear, and that must be averted at any cost. So today we are praying that the central government takes a sensible view and uh, orders compulsory licensing and does the technology transfer to more than uh, uh, half a dozen companies that are there, can do, can replicate and produce the vaccines to the quantities that we want. Uh, of course, this is simplifying the problem. I know it's not so simple, but this is an issue that has to be faced uh, with, with you know, full uh, vigor. Thank you very much. Uh, probably before I come to Joyti, <laughs> there were these two questions which are both, and I know you work on this issue, uh, about waiving the IPR and um, how quickly that would really lead to an expansion of production capacity here. Yeah? Uh, and there's some skepticism in some of the uh, comments and uh, for Shadow, there is also this uh, uh, comparison of EU's position in relation, uh, in comparison to the US and the UK. Uh, there were quite quite a lot of exports of uh, of uh, vaccines from the EU, while there was nothing so far from the US um, and 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 the UK. Uh, one other thing, uh, it's uh, probably the audience might not be aware, but in the past, 
India was producing 60% of global vaccines. Yeah, <laughs> so India is a that childhood vaccine, uh, Michael. So On it's mostly China. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm not talking vaccine. about the COVID vaccine, of course. Yeah, yeah. but I think the, the overall the vaccines, range of vaccines. Yeah, it's always the Western countries that have had a dominant supply position on the yeah, influence yeah, of yeah. vaccines. So uh, and probably still coming back to this IPR issue. Um, uh, and compulsive licensing. We discussed it extensively in the preparation, <laughs> but I would like to, uh, compulsive licensing makes sense if it's really coordinated international effort, I guess, no? Because uh, each, uh, product, each vaccine has ingredients produced in many different uh, parts of the world and there are different patents holders in, in, of these ingredients. So it really has to be a, a concerted international effort uh, in terms of this uh, waiver. With these uh, questions, I come to <laughs> Joyti, who is really an expert on this uh, debate. Yeah. Thank you so much. And also for these very interesting questions. So look, let, let's just clarify on the vaccine issue, what exactly this TRIPS waiver is. The TRIPS waiver is a request from not just India and South Africa, but now it is 120 countries in the WTO who are requesting that all the IPRs related to vaccines, drugs, treatments, diagnostics be suspended for the period of the pandemic, that is until herd immunity is achieved. So it doesn't cover only vaccines, it covers all of them, okay? But what does it do? It's a very limited thing. In fact, when people realize that that's all that they're asking for, it actually seems quite ridiculous. What, what are we asking for? Only that you will not face a case in the WTO if you issue a compulsory license. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything else. It's really a minor, minor thing. And for that, you have the pharma companies going up in arms and Angela Merkel saying that this will inhibit innovation. I mean, really? All it does is to say we are going to suspend all the IPRs for the period of the emergency, which the TRIPS agreement explicitly says it should not be applied in periods of emergency. There are exceptional circumstances where these should not be required. It says that. Yet in this global pandemic, all they're saying is suspend the IPRs for all of these diagnostics, treatment, vaccines, everything, until we solve this particular pandemic, until we have dealt with it at a global level. Now, why is that necessary? Because as Michael said, many of these, it's not just for that particular drug, but the production of that drug uses many other things. The mRNA vaccines, for example, use 72 different steps or ingredients. About 18 of those are patented by other companies. So it's not just enough to deal with Moderna and Pfizer. You have to deal with all of those companies. The waiver would get rid of all of those issues. But let's also be clear, the waiver only provides legal protection. It does nothing else. The transfer of technology is the next big thing. And you obviously have to have the transfer of the knowledge, otherwise you can't produce. So let's, these are two equal legs. The waiver is the minimum necessary condition. Thereafter, you have to have the transfer of technology. When you, we are saying that somewhere the governments have to push these companies to do that. Why? Because WHO set up the CTAP COVID-19 technology access pool to do that for companies to make available their technologies. Nobody has joined, not a single company. 48 developing countries have joined, but nobody, nobody who has any knowledge has joined this pool. There are companies, not just in India, but in Canada, in Sweden, in, in Bangladesh, in Australia, in Chile, in Brazil, who have requested licenses from AstraZeneca and from Pfizer and have been denied. So they are willing to produce, they are accepted producers, they have got facilities, they are ready to produce tomorrow, but they have been denied licenses by the companies. Now this clearly governments have to lean on them because these are publicly funded research. AstraZeneca should have been publicly available knowledge. It was meant to be midway through the proceedings in the middle of 2020 the Gates Foundation steps in and forces Oxford University to do a single deal with AstraZeneca. It could have been public knowledge. In the US, the Biden administration has made uh, Johnson & Johnson share its technology with Merck because they wanted more of that vaccine. Why can't they tell Johnson & Johnson, share your technology with other companies? We paid for it. They have paid entirely for Moderna. Moderna has therefore promised not to make profits, so-called. Why can't they tell Moderna to share the technology? It was entirely publicly funded. Now, what I'm saying therefore is that we need both. 
we have to have that waiver to prevent all of these cases, but we also have to have the sharing of technology. And this is something governments can do because governments paid for this knowledge. It's not that this was done by these brilliant people operating out of the blue. mRNA technology was anyway developed, I think, by a Hungarian researcher then used in the US science labs. And then the last mile, the last little bit was done by Pfizer and Modern, well, by BioNTech and Moderna with public funding. So these are really publicly created things. They should be publicly available, disseminated, especially now in this period of extreme urgency. So that's just on the, the vaccine issue. On the medium term Indian response, everything depends on what the government of India does. Of course, it could well be, I don't know, I forget the shapes, the alphabets, you know, V and L and Q and uh, whatever, but it could be a recovery depending on the government of India's response. Thus far, it has been abysmal. We have had a macroeconomic uh, negative stimulus in terms of new fiscal spending. And that, if that continues, then you know you may get more exports because the rest of the world is reviving and so on. You may get um, you know some companies doing very well and their assets going up as we have seen with Ambani, Adani and a few other favored companies. But you will not get a revival of employment, of livelihoods, of the conditions of life for most people or of even food and nutrition as Sujata was saying. And that's the revival that we have to look for. We are not interested in whether profits of some companies revive or we are really interested in whether the economy as a whole and the material conditions of the people improve. For that, you have to have more government spending. You have to have directed spending that goes to meet the uh, employment and the, the, the real needs of the people and has very strong multiplier effects. And if that happens, yes, definitely we can re recover. If that doesn't happen, so far it hasn't happened then in fact, I do see a medium term slump with very, very terrible implications. Lastly, very quickly, Michael, sorry. On Radhika, I think Desai, hi Radhika, has mentioned the question of Kerala. Mm -hmm. You know, the Kerala model, I think it's a very fascinating, interesting, excellent model, but they also are really, because it is a, a high public spending model, as it should be, health should be a major part of the public spending. Yet, uh, and they are being starved of funds at the moment, as you know. And that has dramatically impaired their ability. I, I was speaking to uh, Shailaja, the Minister of Health, who has done a remarkable, amazing job. And the conditions under which they have to fight this are getting more and more dire because of the fiscal strain, because it's just so difficult to actually achieve the kinds of things that they have done, even though they're based on community participation, on volunteers, on all of that. We know that there's an explosion of cases in Kerala at the moment, and that there is, you know, it's really they're finding it very, very difficult to deal with because what they're trying to do is maintain the social protection for those who cannot work, for the migrants who are stuck in Kerala, for, you know, they're trying to make sure that they get enough to eat, that they're fed clothes, that those, the families of those who are afflicted have adequate care. All of these are expensive. So I go back to the center state thing that, you know, it's an excellent model, but Kerala cannot do it on its own, especially with a, a, a central government that is not providing the resources and is act actively preventing them from being able to do what they need to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Shada. I'll probably uh, say a little bit more on the politics in the EU of what might change <laughs> in relation between governments, pharmaceuticals, their behavior and how it will uh, impact um, EU's relationship both with the developing world, in Af Africa in particular, but also uh, the transatlantic situation and what will emerge from that, Shada. So, so Michael, uh, thank you for that. I mean, uh, I think I can just imagine the kind of bargaining and pressure and lobbying that is being undertaken at the moment by pharmaceutical companies vis-a-vis -vis the European Union uh, leaders, vis-a-vis -vis the members of parliament, national level, EU level. I'm sure all kinds of discussions are taking place and there will be a lot of pressure from pharmaceutical companies actually uh, to not give in on this issue and to say that this is something that is uh, will not lead to 
long, this will lead to long-term changes, but in the emergency, it's more about exports of vaccines, components, and, and other things. So I can just imagine the kind of pressure that is being put, because you can tell already from some of the comments of the, of the record comments that are coming out in the media and in my conversations, that the IPR, IPR issue is seen here as a step too far uh, without any immediate impact on relieving um, uh, the, the situation in, in India or even further if it happens, hopefully not in Africa. So I can just imagine, as you said, the politics of it. I just want to come back to Gerald Silverberg's point as also. And I think I did say that exports are uh, going out from the European Union. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen has said, the Commission President said that we are now the pharmacy of the world because we're exporting as much as we are actually delivering vaccines, I mean, exporting vaccines as much as we are delivering uh, within, uh, within the EU. Um, my point is not that. Of course, uh, that is a very strong commitment to solidarity and just reflect very well on the European Union and the European Commission. But we're not thinking long term. We're not thinking ahead. And those are the points that Jayati and Sujata have brought to the table about transfer of technology, about uh, the waiver for patents, about ramping up production, about solidarity globally. Uh, and that kind of leadership, I think, is very much missing. The ability to look ahead, to stay one step ahead. Um, you talked about you know, market forces and uh, vaccines. There was a, a strong debate about that last year when we were really feeling you know, that there was shortage of supplies. So there was a debate on this in, in political circles. Uh, that debate doesn't exist anymore because things are back to so-called normal. We're easing out of our lockdowns. So um, the media, the policy wonks, the, the, you know, the policy makers, it's step by step. And each time something new comes up, we're distracted and we forget the previous debates and very important discussions we've had. And we're living in this kind of, you know, from emergency to emergency kind of situation. And my point is that we are now at a stage where we can, um, because we have some ease, uh, easing of restrictions, ease of mind, uh, people are starting to meet again in real life, provided there is not a third wave, we have this policy space for further reflection. And uh, India's tragedy is, is a wake up call because as I said, we have to look at what's going to happen uh, or could happen in Africa. And that point you asked me, I have to confess, I have not heard of forward thinking, forward planning of that kind taking place at the moment. Uh, there has not been an EU Africa summit uh, for a year and a half. Um, there have been meetings of course and virtual discussions but that political pressure that people like Paul Kagame and others could bear, uh, bring to bear on the EU has not come yet from Africa. And so once again, you know, no pressure, uh, no media attention, no political attention, no global spotlight glare, if you like, and the European Union is not thinking ahead. That strategic leadership that we need from a, an entity like the European Union, I'm ashamed to say is not there yet, but I am hoping that it will surface and that these discussions that we're having and the public pressure, Jayati, that I talked about, because that is growing and your point is well taken. It needs to come from the people, from parliamentarians that is coming now. It's late, uh, but, uh, but you know, better late than never, though, of course, thousands of lives have, have disappeared, unfortunately. And so I'm hopeful, but I have to say the pressure has to be kept up. So it has to be in the media. It has to be in the policy debate. Discussions like this have to be heard uh, more globally than they are at the moment. But I'm hoping that there will be a change because the European Union takes pride in being uh, ahead of the game when it comes to development and, and partnerships. So it has to walk the talk now. Thank you very much. I think we are coming to an end of this. There is a continuous flow of further comments, but I think we can't pick them up anymore. It's, uh, uh, it just shows how, how, how important the topic is, which we covered today. Uh, there's also this discrepancy. We are living now in Europe where everything is uh, looking forward. We are possibly having a normal summer again. <laughs> yeah? And the discrepancy between that and uh, the global view of uh, how the COVID crisis is going to accompany us and is going to impact not only uh, the developing world, but will have repercussions on, uh, on us back again, <laughs> really means that uh, there is a very, very strong um, demand uh, for us as societies, but of course, uh, putting pressure on policymakers and think of concrete steps in which this global situation really can be uh, faced. So uh, we had a wonderful, <laughs> exciting and lively debate. And I really want to thank you very much. And also the people who sent in questions and comments.
I'm sure we will have on this or a similar topic <laughs> another webinar in not uh, that distance of future. So thanks very much, Kada, Jaiti, and Sujata. We were, you were lovely. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you.